Of course, we need to get more information about the ongoing neuroinflammation. And if we consider the course of Alzheimer's disease, we first know that AD is not starting with the advent of clinical symptoms, but most likely um, is uh, starting many decades prior to those uh, clinical impairments. We now know that a beta deposition as one of the things we can measure by PET imaging uh, may start as early as three decades prior to any cognitive deficits. If we now consider that beta amyloid is such a strong danger associated molecular pattern, we then would uh, conclude that all the subsequent mechanisms are actually um, influenced by the presence of inflammation. But inflammation normally runs in waves, so every inflammatory um, activation is followed by resolution and healing. So it's likely that inflammation is not uh, linear, exponential or asymptotic, but runs in waves. And that's more complex because we now also know that in one hemisphere of an AD patient, there's hardly two brain areas which are in precisely the same uh, stage of disease. While the entorhinal cortex, for example, is long gone, another brain area like the occipital cortex may not even know that there's so much going wrong uh, up in, the, in the front part of the brain. Now, um, consider Alzheimer's disease as a um, um, relay race. A relay race where a beta is the first runner and uh, gives the stick after its round to the next runner, which could be innate immune activation. And when innate immune activation has, has run its round in the stadium, it gives it over to a, second, a third mechanism, for example, mitochondrial um, uh, dysfunction. And finally, the last runner could be tau. But you don't have one team running alone, you have several teams and call one hippocampus, one entorhinal cortex, one parietal cortex, one um, cerebellum, one occipital cortex, and so on. So which means that we most likely have various types of inflammation and responses to different degrees and types of beta amyloid deposition in the very same brain which makes it complex and explains the need for precise biomarkers which tell us in which brain region which inflammatory mechanism is most prevalent. So we can consider um, biomarkers which inform us about microglial activation status. We also will need biomarkers which address uh, the function of microglia, for example, their capacity to still clear amyloid beta or the capacity to release trophic factors. We also will need biomarkers which um, inform us about microglial proliferation and microglial cell death, pyroptosis, so to say. In general, we would like to seek a fingerprint of neuroinflammation in biological fluids, for example, such as the CSF or even better in blood or uh, samples, serum or plasma, which would give us uh, this information. One way to think about fingerprints is to consider post-translational modification. An example could be to measure the final downstream uh, effects of uh, inducible nitric oxide synthase activity which results in nitrosylation and nitration of peptides and proteins. And those patterns of protein and peptide nitration or nitrosylation could actually inform us about the degree of an inflammatory uh, response in the brain, uh, which uh, then could be linked to clinic or uh, other imaging uh, information. What we have right now is that we can measure beta amyloid peptides, tau and phosphorylated tau from the CSF of patients. And while one of these markers alone is less indicative of a certain disease stage, we know that if we, for example, combine them uh, in analysis, we can clinically use them to make a judgment in which stage of the disease the patient currently is. Most inf uh, informative are the uh, uh, ratios between A beta 42 and A beta 40, or between A beta 42 and phosphor tau, for example. Um, more recently, people have looked at neurofilaments, which are uh, likely to give us an even better information with respect to treatment responses. Neurofilaments ca can be measured in uh, the peripheral blood and can give us a hint um, 
about the degree of damage which uh, is ongoing in the brain. And hopefully we can use neurofilaments one day to read our treatment responses when we use anti-inflammatory treatment strategies. All in all, it's important that we need um, longitudinal information. So um, most of the current studies are cross-sectional and give us information about a certain group of patients at a certain time point and stage of disease. But what we really need, and based on the information I gave you before about the long course of the disease, is longitudinal data which show us at which time point and which stage of disease connected to a, a certain uh, symptom the respective inflammatory parameter comes up and gives us a sign for a mechanism or a certain stage of the innate immune system. So what are the novel and interesting targets in neuroinflammation? And let me emphasize up front that this is a personal list I will give you. Uh, we can consider um, targets which come from genetic information which includes tarab BP, um, TREM2, PLC gamma, CD33 and of course those have evidence by genetic risk uh, polymorphisms which uh, increase or decrease the risk to develop Alzheimer's disease and, of, uh, and are all tightly linked to um, the immune system and in most cases to innate immunity itself. Um, then there are uh, targets which come from experimental studies which include um, for example toll-like receptors uh, the NALP inflammasome, um, um, the ASC specs, um, sigma-1, uh, PPAR gamma, uh, and progrenaline. And uh, we also have to consider single cytokines by more recent evidence, for example, showing that Enbrel may or may not be effective. And those data have to be revisited, but would uh, uh, put TNF-alpha uh, up front. And like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1-beta could be an interesting target itself because it's the downstream um, inflammatory cytokine which results from the ALP3 inflammasome activation in microglial cells. Now um, another uh, point to discuss and consider is the innate immune memory. We have assumed for decades that only adaptive immunity has a memory cell uh, and can keep information for a long time but it turned out uh, by work from Mihai Netea and others that innate immune cells also have a certain uh, memory type of information storage and maybe these memory informations could be an own target because they set the scene for an even stronger immune response when a second or third challenge occurs. Now um, one important point is that these targets I just told you may undergo changes where along the entire disease course. So one of these or each of these targets may have its own therapeutic window or its own time where it can be um, targeted and therapeutically harnessed. Uh, it may be that at a certain stage uh, modification or degradation, uh, an inactivation by a phosphorylation for example, uh, as it is likely for PPAR gamma, completely shuts down the respective pathway and makes it inaccessible for a therapeutic intervention. 